Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Lunch and Learn series um, hosted by Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens and presented, presented in partnership with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, the Alabama Green Industries Training Center, the Jefferson County Department of Health, Jefferson County Commission, City of Leeds, Alabama, City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, and the Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated. Now I'm going to turn everything over to John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you're here. Thanks for uh, uh, being a part of this today, and we uh, appreciate all that uh, the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens uh, and all the partners do to help get this information out to, to everyone. Today, we've got Dr. Dave Hahn here with us, uh, Associate Professor uh, Crop Soil Environmental Sciences from Auburn University and, ex and, and Extension Specialist for Turf for Alabama Extension. Dr. Hahn uh, has his BS degree, Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University in Biology and went on for Master's uh, in Plant Pathology and in 1999 got his PhD from Ohio State in Plant Pathology. And been uh, with, with Auburn, I guess, pretty much ever since. And, and, a long time, over 20 years, uh, Dr. Hahn's been with us. We appreciate everything Dr. Hahn does and is a, a great asset to our resources in Alabama for getting the word out about turf and how um, anything and all things with turf, whether it's turf grass management, lawn care, sports fields, construction, maintenance. He's got a, a good field behind him there. Uh, lots of uh, hard work going on that and is consulted widely uh, in, across the industry. And we appreciate your time, Dr. Hahn, for being here with us today, and uh, we'll let you get started. Sure thing. Thanks a lot, John. So yes, I've been at Auburn now since April of 2000. That's when I started at Auburn. So I've been here for so long now um, that now I actually uh, I'm happy when people say to me, oh, you look way too young to be doing what you're doing. So that'll give you an idea of how, how long it's been. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, with the slides. And uh, if uh, anybody has trouble seeing the slides or anything like that, uh, just let John know, he'll, he'll poke me or something. But anyways, um, we could talk for four or five hours about turf grass maintenance. I mean, I, I do do that, but I won't subject that to you uh, right today. Uh, but what I will do is kind of hit some of the high points um, about maintaining uh, lawns. Uh, John had asked, um, I guess because uh, some of you all have been asking about this for some tips about which grasses do best in the shade and, and how best to keep weeds out of uh, your lawn and what to look for in the fall for weed control. So we'll hit some of these, a uh, bunch of wide ranging topics. Um, you know, please go ahead and put any question you have in the chat and uh, uh, we'll uh, try to leave plenty of time for those at the end. So uh, with that, I thought I was gonna start off uh, from the weed angle and, and ask, okay, so why do we have weeds in the first place? I mean, if a weed crops up in a lawn, what is that actually telling you? Um, a lot of times when weeds get bad, and I'm not talking about maybe just a single weed popping up here and there, but a whole bunch of weeds in a given location, that's actually trying to tell you something. Something about the environment that you're given the grass to grow in is probably not as favorable to the grass as it is to that weed plant. Happens all the time. There could be a lot of different things. Sometimes it's light, shade issues lead to a lot of weed problems. Sometimes it's the soil, whether it's compacted soil, so nutritional status, um, water. But there's usually uh, something that the grass is trying to tell you by thinning out and dying. And so I think it's worth it to kind of uh, look at how we can um, maintain our turf a little bit better to try and keep up a nice, healthy, dense stand of turf, because this is a slide that I've been using almost for 21 years now, uh, which is to remind people that a healthy, thick turf is the best defense against weeds. And um, there was an old weed scientist at Auburn who was one of my mentors when I first started off as a, uh, as a young professor here at Auburn. Uh, his name's David Team. He's retired now, but he used to always tell me, hey, you can't have two plants occupying the same space at the same time. So if you have a nice, dense 
uh, turf with lots of grass plants in there, you, you, you can't have a whole lot of weeds in there. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, good maintenance of a well-adapted turf grass goes a long way. You know, it doesn't eliminate all, all weeds. This just happens to be a St. Augustine grass lawn here in, in Auburn, where I live, um, that has a couple of weeds here and there, but overall is doing really nice, looks good, he is getting the job done of, you know, being a good looking functional ground cover in what is actually some pretty heavy shade. Okay. Um, but you don't have to go very far uh, to find areas where there's something not quite right here, right? This is supposed to be a centipede grass lawn from a different house here in Auburn. And um, uh, you'll have to pardon, you know, my dog's head in the picture there. I, I take a lot of photos that I end up using uh, in either uh, classes here at Auburn or extension type talks uh, when I'm out walking my dog because when I'm on foot, moving kind of slowly, I can see a lot more things. So, you know, these days, everybody's got their phone with them at all times. So I just take it out and, and take some pictures. But occasionally, uh, my dog's one of them will make a cameo in some of these pictures so just be ready for that but but we got a bunch of different weeds growing here so there's something going on with the way that this lawn is or maybe isn't being maintained that's not favoring the grass but is favoring all of these other plants which we're going to consider weeds so the first thing i want to talk about is uh, something which at this point of the year you're probably about three quarters of the way through your um, fertilization cycle for the year if not more than that but it's still something to think about and something to think about uh, for next year as well, which is, okay, how much am I going to fertilize? And this makes a big difference. Um, I'm going to go in rough order of the hungriest grasses or the grasses that can benefit from the most nitrogen uh, down to the grasses that really need the least amount of nitrogen. And I really am going to talk about nitrogen only. You can see here on all of these slides, phosphorus and potassium, I am going to say, look at your soil test. If you don't have a soil test, get one. That's something which, again, we in extension say all the time. We probably say it so much. Some of y'all think we're paid by the mention of soil testing. Uh, we're actually not, but we could be. I could make a decent living that way, uh, simply because it's so important to know what's going on in, in this ground that you're trying to grow any plant in, whether it's your, your lawn, your trees, vegetable garden, flower beds, shrubs, you name it, get a soil test, figure out what's going on in that lawn, sorry, in that soil underneath that lawn. So uh, for me to grass nitrogen, we wanna use anywhere between about three and five pounds of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet on the lawn every year. Okay, and usually this is broken up into uh, monthly uh, applications, maybe every two weeks if you really like to go out and, and uh, spread fertilizer. Um, so monthly applications of somewhere between a half a pound and one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet through the growing season. So call it May, June, July, August, September, uh, maybe October if it's a uh, particularly uh, hot uh, fall. Um, that'll, that'll get you in that range there. Now, it used to be that we were, or at least I was, really a little bit squirrely about recommending nitrogen on a warm season grass in September, but uh, I'm not anymore. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is it is getting hotter and it is staying hotter later than it was 20 years ago. Um, warm season grasses are still doing an awful lot of growing right now. And here it is September 8th. And a lot of years, we don't really see dormancy setting in, even in a place like central Alabama, until middle of October or even into November. Down here in Auburn, it's often Thanksgiving before um, anything like that happens uh, in the past you know, 10 or 10 years or so. So I don't think that um, a little bit of fertilizer, like I said, somewhere around a half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet <clears throat> is... Uh, inappropriate in September anymore, and maybe even not even into the beginning of October uh, in central Alabama. Uh, but you don't want to go too much above this range uh, on Bermuda grass unless you just need a whole lot of growth. So more for sports fields. So if you were taking care of a football field this fall, you'd be fertilizing it more because you're going to need a high rate of growth 
to recover from having football played on it. Um, but I don't recommend you use that much on the lawn. It's, it's really not necessary. All you're going to do is just end up making yourself mow the lawn more. Um, to drive that point home, here's just um, some uh, work that we did, uh, gosh, 10 years ago, <laughs> looking at um, how increased amounts of nitrogen, this is a total amount of N for the growing season, increases the total number of mowings you needed to keep um, the grass an inch and a half tall, uh, mowing it every time it got up um, to where we were cutting off a third of the leaf blade at any one mowing. And so you can see for the, these are cumulative mowings for <clears throat> months of June and July and July and August. And yeah, big surprise. If you don't fertilize for many grass, it doesn't grow. But if you do, it grows. And the more you fertilize it, the faster it grows and the more you have to mow it. So there you go. 11.2 on average mowings in the months of June and July. So that's more than once a week. You know, I try to convince people to, if they have many grass lawns in the middle of the summertime to mow them twice a week and, and often get some pushback on that uh, simply because there's there's one weekend uh, per week, right? And, and a lot of people just, uh, myself included, don't often feel like coming home from work in the middle of the week and, and going out and mowing the lawn. But, but a lot of times if you've got Bermuda grass, it'll absolutely benefit from it. Uh, the next grass, the next most uh, hungry grass is St. Augustine grass. Usually, however, we're going to recommend three to four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet every year. Um, and again, phosphorus and potassium, soil test to see how much of that you need. This, uh, this grass is something that we do see in central Alabama, particularly in the shade, because St. Augustine grass is one of the best uh, warm season grasses is, is, is in terms of shade tolerance. That still doesn't mean it's great in the shade. There's really no grass that is going to be able to withstand more than about, uh, or less, I should say, less than about four hours of sun uh, per day. Um, so directly under the uh, drip line of a, of a magnolia or a big oak tree or something like that, that's not really grass territory. And if you try to grow grass in that much shade, I can guarantee you're going to have weed problems and you will until you either give up and realize <clears throat> that there's other plants that grow much better underneath trees than grasses do or get rid of the tree. Your choice. Most people do the former, right? It's really common for lawns to shrink in size as houses get older um, and the trees get bigger. You know, if, if you have moved into a brand new subdivision in the past couple of years, everything's wide open, all the landscaping's young, trees are still small, you can have grass pretty much anywhere you want to. But you won't in 20 years if you keep all the trees and uh, keep all the shrubs um, because shade is going to become an issue. And it's perfectly natural and perfectly okay for the lawn to shrink in size as the trees grow. And some of the areas underneath the trees that aren't getting enough light to grow grass start growing, um, you know, uh, shade loving ornamental plants, you know, like their azaleas or hydrangeas or whatever, put some uh, mondo grass in there, put some pine straw, you know, gravel, make a little natural area, however you want to do it. Um, I do spend an awful lot of time telling people where not to grow grass because, you know, just like banging your head against the wall, it feels so good when you stop trying to grow grass in places that it's just not well adapted to. Next, we got zoysia grasses, which are, um, it's a large group of grasses. So depending on which zoysia you're growing, you're gonna to wanna to use somewhere between one to three pounds of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet on those every year. Um, and again, soil test for your other nutrient requirements. Um, and this is a uh, grass which newer varieties of zoysia have been popping up, especially in the last 15 years or so that are much improved in their shade tolerance compared to the Meyer and emerald zoysia grasses that used to dominate. So when I first uh, came to Auburn, first started working with southern grasses in 2000, the vast majority of the zoysia grass throughout the whole state, certainly it's true of central Alabama, would be either zoysia, uh, sorry, Meyer zoysia or emerald zoysia. Those were the two dominant zoysia grasses. But now we've got a bunch of new varieties. We've got things like Jammer, we've got Zorro and Xeon, uh, Empire came. Uh, that's, that's an older one, it's been around 15 years plus now. Um, Palisades, um, 
we have a lot of new soil sugar ash varieties and I got to tell you a lot of these new ones are doing just as well in shade trials as St. Augustine grass does and they offer a big advantage over St. Augustine grass for the Birmingham metro of being much more tolerant of cold weather. Uh, in Birmingham some years it can get cold enough where you get a lot of winter tail on St. Augustine grass but zoysia no they usually survive that so um, I'm starting to recommend a lot more zoysia grass in shady spots um, but again it is a grass and so you get down to less than four hours of sun and it will thin out on you okay it's, it's still a grass and so you have to remember when I or anybody talks to you about how a turf grass is, is shade tolerant or good in the shade you always have to remember we're talking about compared to other grasses so as long as your grasses are decent in the shade for a grass but that's not the same thing as actual being shade tolerant okay the last uh, grass species i want to talk about in terms of nutritional requirements and just general tips on care is going to be centipede now centipede grass is kind of the oddball out of all the warm season grasses because actually fertilizing it a lot um, tends to kill it and it tends to kill it pretty efficiently actually. Um, if people don't want centipede grass in their lawn, if they've got centipede grass invading say a Bermuda grass or a St. Augustine grass lawn especially, but I'm going to soysia grass, if you bump up the amount of nitrogen you're giving that lawn to three or four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, you can get the other grasses to take over centipede in just a couple of years in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, it really is well adapted though to infertile, uh, low pH, just you know, compacted red clay, general bad soil, uh, which we have a lot of in the state of Alabama. So from that standpoint, I mean, don't fertilize your centipede grass maybe every other year, or maybe like half a pound a year, up to a pound at the most if it's well established. This picture right here is a picture I took many years ago with one of the most beautiful centipede lawns I've ever seen. They don't fertilize it, okay? They just mow it. And um, you can see it's getting plenty of sun, so that's good. And it is a lighter green color than other grasses naturally. So sometimes there is that temptation to kind of jack up um, the nitrogen in order to get it to be a darker green color. And don't do that, okay? Um, centipede is so well adapted to low fertility that it can take over. It takes a long time, but it can take over other grasses if you don't fertilize at all. We had a study that we went for five years on a Bermuda grass plot without fertilizing it one bit. No um, fertilizer at all, no nitrogen at all. And the centipede grass from the alleyways ended up invading uh, more than six feet into these plots. Um, and the Bermuda itself just kind of shut down. See all this dormant grass here? That's not because it's cold, it's middle of summer. It's Bermuda that's shut down because it hasn't been fertilized in five years. And you have all these centipede grass runners moving into that Bermuda plot and taking it over. And yeah, you got some other weeds too because the Bermuda ain't growing. And centipede is slow to grow, so this takes years, but it can actually happen. I've seen it happen. Uh, not just in our experimental pots at Auburn, but I've seen it happen on lawns too. Centipede just take over other grasses when you don't fertilize. Or when the pH is below five, well, no, sorry, below six. Um, you get down below five, even centipede starts to show, slow down its growth. But at a pH of like five or 5.2, three, zoysia, Bermuda, they slow way down their growth. Centipede just keeps trucking along. Uh, you know, like that tortoise, um, it's going to win the race if, uh, if you leave the conditions low fertility and, and low pH. Okay. Um, we had talked about shade issues and here's a really, really nice example of uh, some shade uh, that is so severe that you are not going to be able to grow much in the way of grass here. So this is actually um, back behind the president's mansion at the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. So, and I don't say that to, uh, you know, insult any Alabama fans, but just to mention that, um, you know, even places that have a budget, you know, suffer from some of the same issues that everyone else does. This back garden here has, you can probably see it at the top of the uh, slide, 
a big magnolia that overhangs most of it. And look at all the shade it's thrilling on this area. So this here is Dr. Beth Gertal. She's uh, my colleague uh, here at Auburn. We were up there um, looking at this lawn and you know, they were basically asking us, okay, what can we do here to deal with all the shade? We've tried tall fescue in here um, and it didn't last. We've tried sodding it with zoysia grass and it didn't last. And I gotta tell you, if you can't, if there's too much shade for fescue and for zoysia, you are just about out of luck as far as grass goes. There, we really don't have too many options, if any, that, uh, that, that are more shade tolerant than those two. Certainly not that'll grow in Alabama. Now we've got green stuff growing here, but if you look real close at it, this is a, just a zoomed in uh, picture of this. It's not a lot of zoysia grass, is it? It's mostly dichondra and some nut sedge, probably yellow and purple nut sedge coming up. And maybe if some crabgrass it got in there and some, some zoysia, every once in a while you can find a little sprig of zoysia still poking through. Oops, but this was three years after they had solid sodded with zoysia. Honestly, for this purpose right here, if they want to keep grass in there, probably just resodding it every couple of years is going to do the trick. It's fairly expensive, obviously, you know, but if you can afford it and you need to have grass there because, you know, they rent out that lawn space for events and whatever, okay, fine, do it. Um, but if it were my backyard and I had a big old tree and, and well actually they have several big old trees that are shading the area and it's it's not growing grass I'd either have to accept this other vegetation that's here that is more shade tolerant than a turf grass or or just punt and you know turn this into a nice pine straw or mulch or something area maybe with a footpath and some shrubs and stuff and, and do something creative with it like that because it ain't gonna be a lawn uh, certainly not as always grass or fescue or St. Augustine grass lawn for very long that's just that's just the way it is when we, when we talk about um, how much light grasses need to grow, you think about this ranking, or at least this is the way I think about it. And um, I purposely titled my categories um, so that I don't give the impression that any of these grasses are actually good in the shade or love shade, right? So the species that's worse would be Bermuda grass, not quite as bad seashore paspalum. We don't see a whole lot of seashore paspalum in central Alabama on lawns. Um, that's mostly because of its cold tolerance is, is not great. It's a little bit less cold tolerant even than St. Augustine. Um, and it's mostly available in Florida and coastal Texas and, and places like that. There's not a lot of soft farms growing it yet um, throughout most of Alabama. Um, but if we were closer to the coast, yeah, that's better than Bermuda in the shade, but it's not as good as Zoysia or Centipede or, or St. Augustine. So this was our historical ranking. This is, this is how I learned it. When I was talking to the, you know, the old hands, you know, again, when I first started Auburn, 2000, coming from Ohio, having lived in the Midwest and the Northeast, I had a lot to learn about warm season grasses. And, and there are a lot of folks who really helped me out, uh, both here at Auburn, uh, but also James Horton, who's a former uh, um, horticulture director at the Botanical Gardens, helped me out tremendously when I was first starting at Auburn. He, at that time, was at Legion Field. Um, and he was taking care of the natural grass field. Yes, it was natural grass in 2000. They still had the grass there that they put in for the 96 Atlanta Olympics. Um, they didn't go back to artificial turf at Legion Field till the mid 2000s. And then when, jo when James moved over to the uh, Botanical Gardens, now he's, he's continued to keep helping me. Uh, Lee McElmore at Country Club of Birmingham taught me an awful lot about taking care of Bermuda grass fairways uh, and how to keep bank grass alive in the Southeast. Um, so there's a lot of, I got a lot of um, help from a lot of different people, but this is, this was the uh, way we thought about shade tolerance and warm season grasses. But uh, some recent and not so recent research, this is stuff that's published all the way back to 2012, um, has really shown us that some of the newer zoysia grasses are getting really good. This is some data looking at the amount of light that it takes to keep a, uh, acceptable quality turf going for, for these different uh, turf grasses, okay? And so uh, basically the way you read this is the, the higher the number, uh, the more light energy it takes to uh, keep that grass in an acceptable state. And, uh, oh, I was gonna have my visual aid here. I, I do have it, okay. So you can buy things like, I'll put this up next to the camera. 
Oh, that's not working too well with the background, but I guess you can see it. I've got this, um, a bunch of these actually just portable light meters and they have little stakes on them and you can just stick them in the ground and they'll record um, how much light energy falls on them, you know, uh, during a day and come back to them and read them. And uh, basically it gives you something they call a daily light integral, but that's just a, a number which gives you a cumulative amount of light energy that these uh, things are recording. And so the higher the number, the more light it takes to keep that grass in good shape. So here's good old TIFF labor meter grass uh, needing somewhere in the order of, in the spring and fall, 18 and a half to maybe 22 and a half moles per square meter per day. Uh, you can see that drops in, in a couple of the newer um, hybrid Bermuda grasses that are bred for a little bit better shade tolerance. Centipede, here's centipede, last still. Here's St. Augustine, our good old buddy Florentine of St. Augustine. And then here's some of the newer zoysias. And you can see these are just statistically, they're already different from the, uh, from the St. Augustine. So if you ask me these days, I actually say, look, we got a bunch of zoysia grasses that have come on the market, especially since 2010, that are you know, uh, just as not bad in the shade as St. Augustine grasses are. And so this is good because it gives, us, it gives us more options. And especially in a place like Birmingham, it's really good because the zoysias that have shade tolerance comparable to the St. Augustines don't bring to the table some of the drawbacks of St. Augustine, like cold tolerance, like chinch bug susceptibility. Those are the two biggies, I would say. So anyways, um, I still lump in like Meyer and Emerald and the Legacy zoysia grasses uh, as, as one notch worse in the shade than the newer zoysias, though. So... There we go. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to stop while I'm thinking about it and real quick answer the question where can you get these light meters? Uh, I got them directly from Spectrum's uh, web page, but I've also seen them on Amazon, good old Amazon. Um, when I got them, they were, I think, 100 bucks for a pack of three of these things. So that's, um, that's how much they cost me. I don't, but I got them a while ago. I don't know how much they are now. I haven't checked the prices. But it's just a um, simple device. It is not complicated at all. Um, that's your light meter. And, you know, it's got this. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn off my background because I think that's what's. Uh, okay, let's see here. I'm going to stop my virtual background for a minute. And, uh, yeah, you screw that in like that. And then you can just stick that in the ground. And um, it's got a little LED readout on it. I think the battery's dead on this one. Yeah, I can't get it to light up, but it'll light up. And, and uh, it'll, it'll, if you push that once, it'll read you instantaneous light intensity. And then you push it again and it'll, it'll read you um, how much cumulative light exposure it's had. So the reason why I'm stopping to talk about these things is because. I find they're really valuable. Now, there's other brands than the Spectrum Light Scout, okay? I, I don't get a commission from Spectrum Technology, so I don't care what brand light medium you buy, um, but they really do help. They help me a lot because I can, stick these, I can stick these in the ground and say, you know, to whoever it is I'm consulting with, whether it's a golf course or a homeowner, whoever it is, you know, stick this in the ground all day, read how much light you're getting in that location. And that really gives us a way to quantify, okay, yeah, so it'll probably work here or eh, it, it probably won't, you know. But you gotta also keep in mind that um, you wanna do it during the time of year when the grass is gonna grow. So it could be that, you know, you're in a location where in the winter time, the sun is so low in the horizon that you don't get up to a critical DOI for grass but you may very well during the growing season, you know, when the sun angle is a little bit higher. So anyways, uh, that's enough about that. Let's uh, continue on. There are some locations, like I said, believe it or not, I was asked, what can we do to grow better grass at this particular location? I'm like, it's, it's a forest. I don't really think there's a whole lot you can do besides cut down trees. Um, plus it has a lot of traffic. Um, they do events here and stuff. Yeah. Anyways, that's not a, a good uh, location for, for growing grass. Um, 
this type of a landscape setup is something that you see an awful lot, but it's good, you know. We got grass out in the open, a little bit of shade here, you know, it might be time soon to, to kind of bring this bed of, I think this is easier to jasmine here, out a little bit farther. Here's the azaleas right underneath the trees. You know, on this side, same deal, right? Some pine stone as is. You can see it's thinning out a little bit over here. Where's the grass the best? Go figure, right? In the middle of the lawn where you get the most sunshine. Um, and there's another thing that you need to remember. With trees, it's not just shade, actually. It's also water. So this is actually um, out of my front yard um, during a dry spell and uh, ignore that. It's mostly Bermuda grass in my front yard. And you can see I got these two big pine trees here and look how dry it is within about 10 or 15 feet of the uh, trunks here. Look how dry that grass looks. That's water competition where the trees are sucking the, all the water out of the soil. And over here, this grass is not looking dry. How about that? Over here, the grass is not looking dry. So anytime it doesn't rain for a week or so, this part of my lawn starts to go dormant first because that's what's getting all the uh, water sucked out of it by the trees. If I don't water that area, that's what happens. And I often don't because um, I don't have an in-ground irrigation system. So it would mean me dragging this thing over here and turning it on manually and turning it off. And you know, who got time for that? Okay, so let's talk more about uh, some weed control here in the uh, uh, little bit of time we've got left. Um, it's uh, true that there's a wide variety of different weeds. Um, you know, that you encounter. Uh, these are some of the more common uh, weeds that we find in turf grass, and they were all conveniently in my trunk at one point as I was transporting them someplace for something. I don't even remember why now. Um, but you got to remember, if you are going to have a healthy turf that does not um, get infested with weeds, you got to do everything else first, right? So first of all, put the right plant in the right place. Don't try to go Kentucky bluegrass in Mobile it's not, or even Birmingham. It, it's not going to work all year long, right? Don't try to grow Bermuda grass in Chicago for the same reason. Uh, have proper fertility. We talked about that. Have good irrigation practices. Basically, what does that mean? Don't irrigate too dang much. If I had a nickel for every time I was out walking my dogs and somebody's irrigation was on when it was raining, I could also probably retire, okay? Um, proper mowing, mowing at the proper height, um, pruning for, uh, you know, getting more light into the grass, all that kind of stuff. Judicious pesticide spraying can help you, especially when you're controlling like diseases and stuff, but even, even for weeds, and we'll talk about that. That's how you get uh, a lawn that is sustainably weed free, okay? All these cultural practices are really, really important, as is, just knowing where grass is going to work and where it ain't going to work. Okay, so let's let's get into it. Uh, I got a lot of pictures of weeds. So I won't subject them uh, to uh, all of them to you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. Sorry about the animations. I thought I turned those off. Uh, herbicides and how we use them. This time of year, we talk an awful lot about pre-emergence herbicides. Why? Because this is one time of the year when we are getting into the season that a lot of winter weeds uh, will germinate. And so whether you're talking about poa annua, or as we like to call it in the South, poana, uh, whether we're talking about lawn burrweed, uh, henbit, chickweeds, these are all winter annual plants, and those seeds are going to be starting to sprout as soon as the ground cools off a little bit. So most years, they start coming up in October, November. Um, POA might even come up a little bit earlier, depending on where you're at. POA is so variable. I've seen POA seeds in a growth chamber germinate at soil temperatures of 80 degrees. Um, not every POA can do that, but there are some that can. Um, so it's time to start thinking about putting out pre-emergent herbicides. These are the things that you apply to the soil before weed seeds to try to germinate. You water them in, they're there in the soil. When the seeds start to germinate, the seeds will 
absorb that herbicide and it'll kill the germinating seedlings. Okay, we have a lot of examples of these in turf. And I realize that these are a bunch of uh, chemical names over here. Uh, sorry to do that to you. Uh, but these are in a lot of products that you can buy just in a uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, you know, garden center. Okay. They're also in a lot of products uh, that you can buy online. I don't know if any of you do this, but you know, you can, uh, in this day and age, go to a bunch of different websites and buy the same herbicides that the pros use, the guys who, you know, you pay to come and spray your lawn uh, can get their hands on. Now you're, you're, you're paying more for them than the pros are because, you know, if you're buying just one, two, two gallon jug of a lot of these herbicides, uh, you know, you're not getting the, the best price on them, uh, but you can buy them, you know, and uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, if you're going to go that route, just, just realize you are going to be buying a lot, probably a lot more than you actually need. You know, most of the containers for some of the, for these things, you know, cover acres worth of grass, you know, so if you've got an in-town lawn and you've got, you know, seven or 10,000 square feet of grass in your, in your lawn, um, you're gonna have to store some unused pesticides. But anyways, um, pre-emergent herbicides, prodiamine, this is probably best known by the uh, brand name Barricade. I'm going to put up at the end of this uh, uh, webinar, a slide which has the uh, web address and the links to our uh, extension publications, you know, on weed control for turf, where you can look up these active ingredients uh, by name and see what products uh, have them in there. Also, Google is, of course, your friend for doing that as well. Um, it's in a, Prodiamine is in a, a product called Barricade, but it's also in a lot of other uh, products. Same with pendimethylins in a lot of products. Um, a lot of these things have a little bit of uh, post-emergent activity too, which is kind of cool. So in Dazaflam, this goes by the trade name of Spectacle in the professional product, but it's also in a, a granular product that you can get um, at retail stores called uh, the Bear, uh, BioAdvanced now, it's not Bear Advanced anymore, BioAdvanced uh, three-in-one with um, a fertilizer and a uh, post-emergent herbicide and a pre-emergent herbicide. And this one actually does have some early post-activity on POA annually. Um, so anyways, we do have a lot of different options um, for pre-emergent herbicides uh, in turf, but they, they all work basically the same way. They have to be in the ground before the seeds try to germinate because that's how they get into the germinating seedling. The germinating seedling is imbibing a whole bunch of water, right? As it uh, is um, trying to uh, sprout and grow. And so if there is that pre-emergent herbicide in the soil at that time, the uh, germinating seedling is gonna absorb that all and it's gonna kill it. If you happen to miss your timing with these, a lot of cases they don't have very much post-emergent activity and they're not gonna do anything. Or if you spray them too early, and these things do degrade over time. All of these, you know, all of these pre-emergent herbicides, um, they do break down in the soil over time through just general microbial activity. Microbes can eat these things and do. So you usually get out of most of these somewhere around two to three months of uh, useful activity out of these before they're uh, gone to the point where they're no longer is a um, dose of herbicide in the soil that's going to kill your uh, germinating weed seedlings, okay? So this fall, I think the two weeds that, that are going to be of most concern to most people are going to be annual bluegrass, aka poa annua, and lawn burrweed for two completely different reasons. Poa because it's everywhere and it's ugly and it's green when the rest of the lawn is dormant, and lawn burrweed because not only is it ugly, but it also makes little tiny seed pods that have about quarter inch long spikes on them that really hurt if you step on them barefoot or actually sometimes even through socks. So these are both annual plants. They're both gonna start germinating in the fall. If you can kill this lawn burrweed either before it even comes up or at the very least before it flowers and makes those spiky seed pods, then you're gonna save yourself getting stuck next March and April. But if you wait until next March, when you 
start to get stuck by the seed pods, it is too late. Those seed pods are already there. And even if you kill the plant, that spiky fruit still exists and it will still stab you. Okay, so if you don't premature this this fall, then at the very least, go out there and look for, I took this picture actually in January of this year, 2021. Um, this is a young lawn burrweed plant that's really not started to uh, fully open its flowers. There's, I think that's a flower bud right there. But if you spray it right now, you're not gonna get stabbed because you can kill that plant before it sets seed and then those, uh, those uh, spiky fruits mature. Uh, but you don't want to do it much later than January. By the time you get into February and March, you know, it could be too late. So um, you can pre-emerge for it this fall, sometime in October maybe. Um, and then maybe go out and put a, uh, a second app of uh, pre-emerge out sometime in November um, uh, for your POA. And that'll get your lawn burrweed as well. But you may want to just make sure that you walk through the lawn in January or early February to see if any escapes need a post-emergent treatment. Uh, because by the time John and, and I and uh, other extension people start getting calls about this stuff in March, about people stabbing themselves with it, you can't do anything, unfortunately. So anyways, now's the time to do that. Okay. There's one other thing to think about, especially when you think about Okay, Poana, I usually get about, depending on the product you use, you're gonna get about two to three months out of it, okay? There are some that have longer residuals, okay? They tend to be the more expensive products. Um, but for the most part, most of your general ones, you can, you can get, you know, maybe three months out of it, you know? Which means if you put it out now for Poa, because Poa's gonna start coming up soon, you'll probably want a second application towards the, around Thanksgiving or something. And then when you go out and you put your first crabgrass application in January, that also take care of your late germination of POA. Um, but think about the products you're gonna use, okay? I'm not picking on Scott's, they just happen to have this line, you know, of turf builder products with different herbicides in them. So you can get this Scott's Halts, which is pendomethylene. It's a very commonly, used uh, pre-emergent herbicide for a lot of different annual weeds, both winter and summer annuals. As you, can imagine, as you can see here, they actually advertise on the bag more for crabgrass, but it also prevents an awful lot of uh, uh, winter weeds too. Uh, this right here is what the bag looks like when it is just that herbicide in it. It's just Scott's Halt's weed Preventer. Whenever you see on a product that says weed preventer, that means it's a pre-emergent herbicide. You know, and they do tell you apply in spring to prevent crabgrass fall application prevents winter weeds. Good, excellent. Over here on the right, though, we got that same herbicide on a fertilizer carrier. Turf builder, that's a fertilizer carrier. See, crabgrass preventer with long food. That's okay if you're going to do it in September. If you have a warm season lawn, there's no need for your November and January applications to be this stuff because your grass ain't going to be using that fertilizer that time of year. It's either going into dormancy or dormant, and it, it really doesn't need fertilizer that time of year. As a matter of fact, if there are any weeds that are already up that you've missed with your, with your pre-emergent or maybe they're perennial cool season weeds, you know, like clover and stuff like that, you're just going to fertilize in weeds with, that, with this product here. So... Yeah, you know, for your dormant season applications, just use the herbicide products. Don't use the weed feeds because you don't need that food at that time. Cool season grasses can use fertilizer well into the fall. So if you have a fescue lawn, okay, I could see putting this out even in November, the weed and feed version of that Scott's Halt's, you know, pre-emergent, but not on a warm season lawn, only on a cool season lawn. And then finally, remember, okay, if it says weed preventer, it's a pre-emergent. If it just says weed killer or if it just says weed and feed, it's a post-emergent product. So this right here is a post-emergent product. This has fertilizer. That's where, why it says feed, right? But it also has herbicide on it. And so this is a product which you can use to clean out um, weeds that are already present in the lawn, but it is not a pre-emergent herbicide. So 
you know, the, the keywords to look for is weed preventer for a pre-emergence herbicide and, and weed killer, um, or sometimes just, you know, nothing at all for a post-emergence herbicide. Okay. With post-emergent herbicides, there's a couple things that I wanted to mention to make sure you get the most out of those. The first is you want to make sure that your grass um, is not mowed the day before or usually the day after application. And the reason for that is really simple. If you're applying these things, especially as a spray, you want to make sure that you have enough time for that herbicide to sit on the weeds leaves and get absorbed before you mow them off. Okay, makes sense. Um, you also want to make sure the weeds are actually growing because then they'll absorb more of the herbicide. So you may want to make sure that you have adequate water and um, also adequate fertility in the lawn. We have a ton and a half of post-emergent products that are um, aimed at the turf market. Okay, um, I just went through a couple, well, I do the, try to do this a couple of times a year and just clip out pictures and, and logos of different herbicides um, that you can find, but there are a zillion and a half of these things, okay? They almost all work on something and what they're gonna kill really depends on what exactly, you know, is in the bag or the bottle of these things. And I know this is you know, kind of a lot, but um, in a nutshell, we can divide what we're gonna try to kill in the terms of weeds that grow in, in the lawns into three different categories of weeds. Broadleaf weeds, so dandelions, um, spurges, um, hand bit, that sort of thing. Virginia buttonweed, um, grasses, crabgrass, Dallas grass, for some people the hay grass is a weed, some people it's a turf, um, poana, things like that. And then sedges, purple nut sedge, yellow nut sedge, green kalinga, things in the sedge family. So if you look on the labels of these um, products, whether they're weed and feeds or whether they're just standalone herbicides, these are the types of um, chemicals that you'll see contained in these products. So for things that are targeting broadleaf, you will usually see one or more of what we call the oxen type herbicides. That's because that's their mode of action. They mimic um, the action of um, oxen hormones in plants. So our good old buddy 2,4-D, which is probably a chemical name that everybody has heard of, right? That's one of these types of herbicides, but we, all, we also have others, dicamba, MCPP. Uh, I'm not going to read all of those chemical names to you, but those are really common. Sometimes thrown in is uh, either this guy, metsulfuron or panoxulin. Those are the two most common in the group we call the ALS inhibitors that have activity for killing broad leaves. Uh, for example, the product MSM turf. Uh, another one is called Manor, another one that's uh, not so much for lawns as it is for like roadsides and stuff called Escort has metsulfuron as the active ingredient. And then sometimes you'll find mixed into the products, the, especially ones that contain these oxygen mimics, either this product, sulfentrazone, or this chemical, carfentrazone. And those are two um, herbicides that when they're in uh, a product at low rates, tend to increase the activity of other broadleaf herbicides. And when they're in there at high rates, they're usually in there to kill sedges. Um, so like sulfentrazone and carfentrazone at high rates kill nut sedges pretty well. At low rates, they increase the effectiveness of other herbicides for killing broadleaves. For grasses, we have things like Clincorac, that's in um, uh, Drive, for example, Q4+. Plus. Um, it's also in like the... Um, Spectricide and the ortho weed be gone uh, products that are, um, you know, weed plus crabgrass killers. The, uh, those products have quinkarak and then they also have like 2,4-D and dicamp in them so that they get both broadleaf and grassy weeds. Um, some of the pro products include things like, uh, again, sulfentrazone at high rates will kill some grassy weeds. And then there's these things which I call, well, not just me, everyone calls them bleaching herbicides because the way they work is by destroying a plant's ability to make pigments. So they literally turn a susceptible plant white before they kill it. So anyways, these are the types of things that you're gonna look for that you're gonna find on the labels of products that are 
aimed at killing these different categories of weeds. Okay, but the, the key to post-emergence weed control is pretty much persistence. Um, if you have a tough perennial weed, it often takes more than one application to kill. And many of the weeds that you're trying to kill post-emergence may be annual, so there may be a lot of seeds in the soil that can keep coming back all summer long. And so persistence is the key. This is actually one of our uh, former turf students when he was on his internship at a golf course. He got to spend a, a little bit of time, fortunately that's not all he did, just going out in spots, spraying weeds on a on a fairway, but that's a, 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 a non-ending task because, you know, they do keep coming back. All right, last thing I'm going to mention is if you do happen to have a St. Augustine grass lawn or a centipede grass lawn, you really need to be careful about what herbicides you use, especially the post-emergent herbicides. And the reason for that is centipede and St. Augustine grass are very much more susceptible to herbicides than Bermuda zoysia are or the cool season grasses. Um, and you'll often see situations like this. So here's um, two different formulations of the herbicide Roundup for lawns, okay? Now this is something that um, seemed like a good idea at the time to some people, which is let's make a line of selective herbicides and slap the Roundup name on them. These don't have glyphosate in them, okay? Um, and Bayer decided to come out with the Roundup for lawns line before all of the lawsuits started with glyphosate and the trade name Roundup became kind of a curse word. Okay, so, but this stuff is still in the in the big box stores. I mean, you still go to Lowe's today and, and buy this stuff. Um, Roundup for lawns, selective. They don't have uh, glyphosate in them, um, but there's two different formulations. There's the regular Roundup for lawns, and then there's Roundup for lawns for use on Southern grasses. See that purple bar there? And when you see that for a product, they're actually talking about St. Augustine and Centipede. That's what Southern grasses in air quotes are um, to these herbicide manufacturers. Even though we grow a lot of Bermuda and Zoysia in the South, when you see anything, when it says for Southern lawns or for Southern grasses, they're talking about using on Centipede and St. Augustine lawns. It has less, excuse me, less of the hormone type herbicides in the uh, Southern grasses um, formulation and uh, so this is going to not burn centipede and St. Augustine, so like this will. So the regular Roundup for lawns, it's fine to use on cool season grasses in general, you know, bluegrass, fescues, ryegrass. It's fine to use on Bermuda and Zoysia. If you use the high rates of this stuff on centipede and St. Augustine, you're going to burn it. So you use this stuff instead. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is the, the other final last thing. <laughs> which is, this is just a reminder that if you go organic with your herbicides, and yes, herbicides can be organic, right? Um, most of these things are not very selective in that they do damage turf, okay? Usually it's a fairly short-lived uh, damage, but, but a lot of them really do damage turf, okay? So this is some work that came out of uh, UC Riverside, published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you can see here, um, this is a mosaic of photos taken, well, you can see across the top, from between 1 and 35 days after application of these different pesticides. You can see here um, different products, what's in them. So here's a citrus oil product. A couple of days after you spray that, you're going to be like, oh, holy mackerel, I killed my grass with it. But it does come back. Um, you look here, uh, clove oil, that's pretty decent, but the, uh, the fatty acid, um, um, uh, Salts are pretty, you know, they have a pretty decent burn potential. So does vinegar. Obviously, the concentration of vinegar is going to uh, uh, dictate how long that lasts and how bad it is. Um, whoops, sorry about that. And then here's glyphosate. Glyphosate takes longer to kick in, but once it kicks in, uh, it's, it's there for a while. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to uh, uh, stop talking. Or no, I'm not going to stop talking. I'm going to stop with the slides. Um, down here is the long address for how to get to our um, guide on um, controlling uh, weeds. Um, actually, 
this is for the commercial, I just realized this, I forgot to change this. This is for the commercial turf one. There's also one for home lawns, which lists the, the products you can get at retail. Honestly, whenever I go to our ACES website and try to find publications, I use the search box and I just type in home lawn weed control or commercial turf weed control and it takes you. Oh, actually, well, actually here under related topics, I guess if you go to that in the screenshot, it does have the uh, link to the, uh, oh wait, this disease control. Well, we have both home lawn and commercial turf uh, weed IPM guides, which will just give you a listing of products that are available and what's in them and, and what they're labeled for. Okay, so with that, I think I will go ahead and maybe I'll leave this up here um, and uh, we can uh, start uh, working through some of the questions here. Any, uh, any other questions besides what's been uh, coming through during the uh, uh, time I've been talking? Okay, I see one here, which is, is fescue a good grass seed for a partial shade lawn? Um, and the answer is, it depends. How's that for a good answer, right? Um, a lot of times it is. So in central Alabama, you do see tall fescue in partial shade um, because it is true. Fescue being a cool season grass, cool season grasses in general are less bad in the shade than warm season grasses are. And, and tall fescue especially has really good heat tolerance for a cool season grass. And so that kind of works in, um, in a lot of central Alabama. Um, fine leaf fescues like a creeping red fescue or a hard fescue, um, they can work, but in a harsh, um, dry summertime, even under some shade, uh, they're going to thin out on you. Um, so you, if you try to go fescue in a, uh, in a partial shaded area in central Alabama, well, this is actually probably even true with, with tall fescue, you're going to find yourself probably wanting um, to thicken that, that lawn up with more seed every fall just to keep the density of the fescue up because, you know, as a, uh, a hot, uh, humid summer wears on and on and on, those things do tend to, uh, to thin out. You know, tall fescue can take heat for a little while, um, you know, but after four straight months of highs near 90 and lows in the 70s and high humidity, uh, even tall fescue does tend to thin out. Um, Debbie Matthews wanted you to elaborate more on light stakes that you mentioned earlier. Yes, I think, um, I think I may have uh, answered that, um, you know, I was just talking about the, uh, these are light leaders, you know, mm -hmm. and they have, and the little stake that you can uh, uh, use to, to just, you know, stick these in the ground so they don't, you know, walk away, um, hopefully, and you leave them in there for a day, and then, you know, you can read the cumulative amount of light that's, that's fallen on this, this little light sensor here, so that's what I was talking about there, and I, I also see another, let's see. She wanted to know where you can purchase them, Hana did. Yeah, that's right. And, and I, I, I got them off the web. So these, these, pers these particular ones are made by a, a company called Spectrum Technologies. It makes a lot of sensing equipment. They make like handheld chlorophyll meters and other, lots of different types, styles of light meters. I bought them from there. I've seen them on Amazon. Um, and um, like Thank I said... You. They have right. some, they're horticultural supply. Yeah, horticultural supply, houses have them, yeah. These things are really nice to have. I mean, just being able to quantify the amount of light that's in a spot where you're going to grow plants. I mean, who'd have thought that would be important, right? You know. <laughs> and um, Hannah also said she, she wanted to know if it's safe to assume that it works for all plants and not just grass, the little light meters. Yeah, I mean, it just tells you how much light there is. So if you know what the light requirement is for a plant you're trying to grow, you know, then they really help. That's, you know, there, there's probably some gaps there for certain plants in terms of how much light do they need. And it really wasn't until, you know, the early teens that we started filling in a lot of the gaps with the turf grasses about how much light they need to have, you know, decent quality in terms of what the DLI is that they need. Yeah. Um. Frank wants to know if your website has a picture guide to identify weeds. Uh, the extension website does not. We have some pictures of the uh, Auburn University uh, Crop Soil and Environmental Sciences Department website um, for identifying uh, common weeds. 
And then um, there is a really nice book, which unfortunately, so now I'm just, it looks like I'm pulling this out of nowhere, but that's because this book lives on my desk at all times. And I have another copy that lives in my vehicle at all times, because I use it a lot. It's called Weeds of Southern Turf Grasses. This, this particular book, as far as I know, unfortunately, paper copies are getting hard to find. We used to sell it from our own extension publications here in Auburn, but we've been out of it for quite a while. So I was uh, telling my turf students to get it from UGA because uh, Georgia had a supply of them, but they come and told me this year that Georgia's out of them too, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's really too bad because uh, there are some cases like, you know, when you're on the road and stuff in areas of spotty cell connections where still having a, a printed book is nice. Um, all of the pictures and descriptions of weeds in this book though, and this is a book that is um, um, co-authored by weed scientists from UGA, Auburn, Clemson, and Florida. Um, and all of the pictures and descriptions of the weeds are hosted at uh, the University of Georgia's uh, website, georgiaturf.com. If you go there and um, uh, click on their uh, pest control section and look for weeds, you can find all of these there. And it's not an ideal situation having a website for them, unfortunately, but that's a really good resource for um, uh, picture guides uh, to weeds. And I really hope they do another print of these sometime. I don't know what the uh, uh, plans are for that, but I mean, you know, this really never goes out of date because the weeds, you know, they're not going to change the way they look. So I still use it. I first bought this thing. I think I bought this thing in like 2003 or something. I don't remember, but I've had them for a long, long time and I still use them all the time. People text me pictures of weeds. Um, oh, that's the other thing. Now there's some really good apps that aren't mm -hmm. um, uh, um, necessarily from extension, but there's some really, really nice uh uh, cell phone apps for um, identifying weed plant ID apps. Um, and even, I mean, honestly, actually, even Google Lens is not terrible at doing that if you get a good picture. Um, and if you know a little bit about what you're doing. So like, sometimes Google Lens will make really weird recommend, you know, like um, linkages to it. And you're like, no, it can't possibly be that if you know something about the plants that actually grow in Alabama, but yeah. What is the best brand of pre-emergent for St. Augustine grass that would control POA? Is that POA? Yeah, POA. Yeah, POA annual. Um, for controlling POA, um, it gets a little bit tricky because POA sometimes is resistant to certain pre-emergences and, and sometimes it's not. Um, and unfortunately, the only way to know is, is basically by experience, whether you live in a spot where POA is resistant or not, you know. So, for instance, on St. Augustine, you can actually use atrazine. And there's several, um, you know, products out there for um, weed control and centipede in St. Augustine. Some of them are weed and feeds and some of them are just, just atrazine. Uh, but sometimes po there are POA populations that are resistant to atrazine. Um, you can use Scott's Halts, which is pendimethalin. Um, that's okay on POA. I would probably use a product that has um, um, maybe some uh, uh, something like a barricade, um, which is prodiamine, you know, or um, the, uh, the, the other product that does really well, which is a little bit more expensive, is um, that um, spectacle, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, um, endazoflam is the uh, chemical name. That's in uh, the herbicide spectacle, um, which is a professional formulation, uh, and that's also in the um, the bioadvanced uh, three-in-one pre and post on a fertilizer carrier product as well. Um, I have the burweed in St. Augustine. Yard has never been managed since the 60s. Grass is well established and chokes out most weeds. Is simply adding a pre-emergent enough to knock out the burweed most likely? Yes, that should be enough just to keep it, uh, keep it from coming up. And like I said, timing, if I was only going after burweed, I would say I would put my pre-emergent out sometime in October or November for the Birmingham area. 
Um, that'll get most of the burrweed and then check it again in January. And then um, if there are any escapes, just hit them with any broadleaf killing post-emergent herbicide at that time uh, should take it out. Burrweed's actually not hard to kill. Um, just what makes it such a bad problem is by the time that people notice the most offensive part of it, which is the you know spiky um, seed pods, it's it's too late to do anything mm. about them. You, just, you know, it's like that they're like miniature sweet gum gumballs, only they hurt more for some reason. Even though they're really tiny, they they hurt more than stepping on a gumball from a sweet gum tree. So. Um, but yeah, it's it's literally a pain in the foot uh, when you get those, or if you sit on them, I guess it's literally a pain in the in the rear end. So, uh, Alex said, "Excellent, thank you." Yes, the three year old notices very quickly. <laughs> oh, I bet, yeah, I bet that <laughs> I bet that's true. You know, and there seems to have, I don't know why I have noticed more lawn burweed in the past maybe five years than I noticed in the in the. Um, preceding 15 years in my own yard and I, I seem to be getting more complaints about lawn burrweed every year. I don't know why that is exactly um, but it is a problem. I mean it's always been here don't get me wrong it's not like some new weed that's just been introduced into Alabama that's certainly not the case but but for whatever reason people seem to be noticing it more it's just a little worse than it has been. So definitely I think you know keep your eyes peeled for it and and even though it's only September, it's really the time to start thinking about controlling it so you don't step on it in March. And I'm not sure if you answered this or not, but Marlene wanted a a good recommendation for pre-emergent for St. Augustine grass to control POA. Okay, I, I think I already answered that, didn't I? I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think that was the last one we answered. Yeah. So... Um, I don't have any more questions on here. If anyone has any more questions, just let us know. If not, we're going to thank Dr. Hahn for his time. Um, we haven't had a turf grass presentation in a long time, and I think it was really needed. So I really appreciate you taking your time today and letting us know um, more about how to care for our lawns. And thank you, John, for organizing all this. I really appreciate your help as a partner. Um, and we are going to sign off for the day. I, I see somebody has their hand raised. Does, I think does they just ask? want to say hey. Oh, okay, okay. Or thank you. <laughs> or bye. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but with that, we're going to let you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again. And we hope you'll join us again. Okay. Sure thing. Right. Oh, wait. What about image for POA? What about image for POA? I guess they um, want to know what it looks like. No, image is the name of a oh, uh, never of mind. side. Yeah, um, and it, it's it's okay on POA. There's there's better things for killing POA post though. Um, it doesn't really have pre activity on POA. Um, it I guess that's you know it's okay. But if I had POA up in the winter time, um, I'm going to assume that it's a uh, a warm season lawn that you're talking about there. Um, I would actually probably use instead of image on it, I would probably use revolver or I would use, um, say katana or monument or something like that. Yeah. So as you, yeah. Um, I mean, if it's actually truly fully dormant, you could even use a low rate of glyphosate on it, but with zoysia, you gotta be careful because it doesn't always go totally dormant. Like it'll look dormant from the top and you'll see mostly just brown leaves. If you look at it. But if you dig down into it, down to the crowns, you'll see some green tissue there. So you spring for POA with glyphosate on soja makes me a little bit nervous most years. I mean, I get, I mean, you know, if we get to the point where like, we have like, you know, a week straight of like, you know, low twenties, high teens, then that's not gonna be an issue. So I'd say revolver or monument or, or katana would probably get you better control uh, than an image for POA. Um, Blair typed in Zozia, Z-O-Z-I-A, along right. with that question about image. Yeah, that was, that was, he was telling me what kind of grass he has. Oh, okay. Zo zoysia grass, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's probably just a typo there for zoysia, yeah. All right, um, thank you all. I'm going to go check on the water stations in our trees and shrubs <laughs> in a few <laughs> seconds. Um, and I hope that you all will join us this weekend for our plant sale. The member sale is going to be Friday. 
um, from four to five thirty. That's the in-person sale. We had the online sale last week on the twenty seventh, and um, the in-person sale for the public is going to be Saturday from nine to two, if I'm not mistaken. So I hope to see y'all there and have a nice day, everybody.